What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with another true crime video. This should be going up on New Year's Eve, so I want to be the first to tell you guys Happy New Year. It has been quite a ride for me in 2022 and I am personally hoping 2023 gets off to a great start and I hope the same for you guys as well. And because it's me and this is the channel that it is, I also want to take this time to remind you guys to stay as safe as possible tonight. Make the best decisions that you possibly possibly can. Please make sure to plan ahead. Make sure you are not alone if you are going out. Make sure that you have a designated driver if you plan on um, enjoying a couple of alcoholic beverages. I just want you guys to make the best possible choices and stay as safe as possible. I do not want to hear that anything has happened to anybody. So today we're going to be speaking about the solved murder of seven-year-old Joan D'Alessandro. And while this little girl may have tragically lost her life far too soon, this is another case that we're looking into where her legacy lives on through multiple laws that have changed the landscape for the way um, things like appeals are handled, uh, victims advocacy, victims rights. There has been so much that has changed directly because of the work put in by Joan's mother, Rosemary, and all of those that support Rosemary and want to honor Joan's memory as best as they possibly can. Joan was born to Frank and Rosemary D'Alessandro on September 7th, 1965 in Bergen County, New Jersey. She was such an incredible, sweet and spunky little girl. I feel like you can just see it radiating from all of the photographs that I've been able to find of her. Her favorite coin phrase was big whoop, which having a child around that age, there's something about kids saying things like that that is just absolutely hilarious. And I can totally see that again, just looking at the pictures of her. Um, she was incredibly outgoing. Joan loved to be surrounded by people. She loved meeting new people. She loved every single one of her friends. Um, she was very sensitive. She was always one that would stick up for others. She was very passionate about those that she cared about. She had a lot of heart in such a tiny little body. Um, she was also incredibly intelligent. She had a lot of different things that she was interested in. Um, she loved to dance. She loved ballet particularly. She absolutely loved art all things beautiful. Flowers were one of her favorite things in the entire world. She was a huge dog person and her favorite color was the color green. Joan was so full of life and it is so devastating to see that that was completely taken away from her and everyone that cared about her. So at the time of her death, she was in the second grade and she was attending St. John the Baptist Elementary School. This is also where her family attended church. Um, they were very religious. This was a huge part of their life. And unfortunately, just days after her death, she was supposed to receive her first communion. Um, so she had a lot of big things happening for her. Um, and she was also very involved in the community with things like the local Girl Scout troop. So she was a brownie at the time. Being around April when her murder occurred. She was at the very end of the finish line when it came to Girl Scout cookies. And ultimately, that is what led to her death. This little girl doing the best to raise money for something that she really cared about, um, to give to the community. And an absolute monster took advantage of that situation. April 19th, 1973 was Holy Thursday. And so Joan was not attending school that day. They had the day off. So she was taking advantage of that to play out Outside of her Hillsdale, New Jersey home. It was just before 3 p.m. She was out there having a great time um, and all of a sudden she noticed that one of her neighbors had arrived home. And this was a big deal because again, she was at the very, very end of delivering the rest of her Girl Scout cookies. She was almost done. And I believe she only had two different neighbors that she had to deliver to. And this car had pulled into the driveway of one of the neighbors she needed to deliver to. So she excitedly ran inside of the home around 3 p.m. that day and told her mother, Rosemarie, that she was going to finish up her Girl Scout cookie deliveries. She grabbed the boxes, grabbed the list of the orders, and off she went. Now, from my understanding, it, despite the fact that this was back in 73, um, even when I was a kid in the early 90s, like we still did a whole bunch of stuff by ourselves. I remember going door to door by myself. Um, this was still a time where the Girl Scouts obviously 
actually made it a big point to not go anywhere alone. So some of the Girl Scout rules were to not go into strangers' houses. When you're delivering cookies or trying to go and sell cookies, don't ever deliver anything alone. Um, but again, this was right down the road. She was supposed to deliver these cookies within houses of her own home. So out the door she went, telling her mother that she loved her and she would be right back. 30 minutes ended up passing and Rosemary noticed that Joan hadn't returned yet. And Joan was very much a rule follower. She was a very responsible little girl. And so if she said she was leaving and she was coming right back, she typically meant it. There was no delay. There were no problems. This had never happened before. But because this had never happened before, Rosemary was thinking, okay, there's got to be an explanation for this. She's having conversation. She's caught up in that, or maybe she's playing with friends. So she did think too much of it. But by 4 p.m., Joan had still not returned. Now, at this point, I believe it had started to rain outside. So her mother kind of tried to chalk it all up to, well, you know, maybe if she did get caught up in conversation or was playing with a friend, maybe she just went inside to get out of the rain at a friend's house. She's waiting for a break in the rain to finish her trip home home. So again, she's got this feeling in her mind, something may be off, but she's trying not to look too deep into it because honestly, who really wants to believe something has happened to your seven-year-old little child? Time kept ticking on and Joan still had not returned home. The rain began to taper off and now it's 6 p.m. It's been three hours since Joan left the house and she is still nowhere to be seen. And so Rosemary knew there is something wrong here. Now, around this time, Frank, Joan's father, arrived at the home. Rosemary told him what exactly was going on, that Joan had left to deliver cookies. It should have been two different deliveries right down the road. She hadn't come back. So Frank immediately jumped into his car and started making rounds around the neighborhood to try to see if Joan was out there on foot. Frank found absolutely no sign of Joan. It was as if she had just walked out of the door of her home and completely vanished into thin air. Now, Rosemary kind of thought back to her conversation with Joan when Joan had first come inside saying that she was about to go and deliver these cookies and she didn't have the order form. So unfortunately, she wasn't able to see the two different addresses that Joan was going to, but she did remember Joan said, I saw the new car pull in the driveway. I'm going to deliver the cookies. And the one house where there was a new car was actually just across the street and three houses down and it was the home of the McGowans. Um, there was a mother, a grandmother, and then the son, 26-year-old Joseph McGowan. So Rosemary began to canvas the neighborhood a bit on her own to see if Joan had even made it to deliver any of the cookies. And she had full intentions of stopping at the McGowan's house to also ask them since they would have been one of the stops. And from everything she gathered, Joan had not even made a single delivery. And when she knocked on the door of the McGowan home, 26-year-old Joseph McGowan answered. So Rosemary stepped inside and she has described it in different interviews that she has, had done is that she walked into the house and immediately she just felt it. She knew that something had happened in that house um, and that someone there was responsible for whatever had happened to Joan. And so she's face to face with Joseph McGowan and knows that she likely was delivering cookies to him just a few hours earlier. So she asked him, you know, do you know where Joan is? Do you know what happened to her? Have you seen her? And without any like concern or really any emotion at all, he very flatly said, no, I have no idea what happened to her and basically just ushered Rosemary out of the house. So by 7 p.m., Hillsdale police were called and notified that seven-year-old Joan was missing and everyone hit the ground running. When I tell you the community effort and the effort from law enforcement was just absolutely out of this world, that is not an exaggeration. So Rosemary ended up telling police that Joan was last seen wearing a turquoise short sleeve shirt. She had on maroon pants, red sneakers, and the red sneakers had white and blue stripes. And she made it a point to tell police that Joan would not run away from home. She was not the kind of kid that would do something 
something like that. And Rosemary was very concerned because Joan wasn't supposed to go very far. And from everything she could gather, she never even made it to either house to deliver the cookies. And she did express to police her concerns specifically about Joseph McGowan. Now, the entire community, as I stated, came together in efforts to locate Joan, hoping that somehow in all of this, this was just some misunderstanding and that Joan was just out there hiding somewhere, trying to stay away from the weather, keep out of the rain. And so all the searches began on foot that night immediately. Police, firemen from local departments, firemen from all of the surrounding counties, all gathered together and began to search on foot. Police went door to door to neighbors to try to question them and see if they had seen Joan or maybe the direction she was going in. This particular road that Joan would have been on led directly to a pretty busy shopping center. And considering the time she was out and about wandering around, they believed someone had to have seen her, but every single person just kept saying, nope, haven't seen her, nope, haven't seen her. We've got no idea where this little girl is at. So by 2.30 a.m. that night, after endless searching, Hillsdale police decided to call in the FBI. They felt that they were in way above their heads, that they needed some sort of assistance. Basically, all hands needed to be on deck to find this little girl as fast as possible. They bring New York State Police also came in to assist. They ended up bringing bloodhounds because at this point, everyone was kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They didn't know what direction to go in, and they were hoping that maybe these bloodhounds could pick up on her scent and point them in some sort of direction. But finally, at around 3 a.m., after hours of searching, no progress at all had been made, so the search was called off with plans to continue it the following day. And that next morning, hundreds and hundreds of people, volunteers, showed up to help, including I believe over 250 firemen. The response, like I said, was just absolutely insane. And because the weather was a little bit questionable, you know, we're talking about New Jersey in April, it was definitely still chilly outside with an hour's notice, barely even an hour's notice, the women's auxiliary in the area decided to get together and somehow prepared over 2000 meals for all of the different searchers that were kind of taking turns, checking all these different locations to keep them fueled and keep them pushing forward. Not just that, even off-duty officers came in to help with the search. This disappearance was affecting and impacting every single person in the community. While I feel like we are so incredibly used to children going missing and people going missing nowadays. And it's not even that it necessarily may happen more often. I don't know the statistics. I mean, now you hear about every single one through social media, but when you have a situation back in the seventies where, you know, you're not hearing about all these children going missing all over the world, like you do now, this was a huge deal. And so everyone stopped what they were doing. So these off-duty police officers stepped up and they began to also help interview the residents while other officers worked hand in hand with volunteers and the fire department to grid search the entire area. Every single yard nearby was searched, every single garage, porch, garbage can, manhole, freezer. If there was a space that Joan could have crawled into hide or someone could have put her against her will, um, that was, it was thoroughly checked. They left absolutely no stone unturned. Every single park nearby, every playground, every single farm. And in all of this, there seemed to be only really one time where there was a bit of a moment of hope, but just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. There was a very similar shoe found nearby. I believe it was like less than a mile away from the home, if I'm remembering correctly. Do not quote me on that. But it was a very similar shoe. And not just that, the shoe was found beside a couple of Girl Scout cookie boxes. And so they immediately began to wonder if maybe this was their first little bit of evidence that would lead them in some sort of direction. But ultimately, they were able to find out that this shoe belonged to someone else entirely. Entirely. And honestly, I will say, I think that is one of the best parts about the community being so involved in this particular search 
when they found something because it was in like such a condensed area around this neighborhood, they were able to say, oh, no, 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 like that's little Jimmy's shoe. Or, you know, they were able to quickly see it. Um, people were familiar with it and familiar with, you know, their belongings. So very easily they were able to rule something like that out instead of spending a ton of time on it. And on top of that, when they really took a good look at these Girl Scout cookie boxes, they had very obviously been out in the elements and just outside for an incredibly long time and not just like a day or so, which is how long they would have been had Joan dropped them from being snatched up or running away or something along those lines. And at this point, authorities really would not clearly state what they believed happened to Joan simply because they didn't know, you know, they were trying to figure it out alongside everyone else. But Joan's family and her neighbors all expressed their concerns that she had been forcibly taken. Pretty much anyone that knew anything about the D'Alessandro family and Joan, she had been raised very well. She had been raised to be aware of strangers and how to protect herself. And so no one believed that she would have just willingly gotten in the car with a stranger or um, entered a stranger's house. Again, she was a very smart girl. So they believed the only way that she could have been taken in the short distance was if it was by force. And within just a few days, their fears were ultimately proven to be a reality. On April 22nd, which was Easter Sunday, I cannot even imagine how this felt for their family, for their church, for the entire community, all of her classmates. Um, but rumors swirled that the remains of Joan D'Alessandro had been found. And not just that, and this is a situation that we just don't see very often looking into different you know, true crime cases, but an arrest had actually already been made. So it turned out that fairly quickly, authorities realized that Rosemary's gut feeling that Joseph McGowan was possibly involved in whatever may have happened to her daughter she was likely spot on with it. So at that time, this is when all the searches were just starting. As I had stated, authorities were going door to door and speaking to different neighbors. Rosemary had made it very clear that she had an off feeling about the McGowan house. They ended up there. And so specifically, Lieutenant James Fallon was one of the officers that had gone around questioning the neighbors and was the first one to speak to Joseph McGowan. Joseph was actually a high school chemistry teacher and and I think it's Tappan Zee High School in New York. Um, and he lived in this house with his mother and his grandmother. And again, it was right across the street and three houses down. And when he was initially questioned by authorities, he gave very inconsistent statements, specifically regarding his alibi. I've tried to dig and figure out what exactly was inconsistent in his statements and what he originally claimed his alibi was, but I have searched thoroughly through every appeal transcript I can find and uh, all the court documents I can find, and I'm just not finding any answers to that. But regardless, he was saying things that were not adding up. The math was not mathing. And so on Easter, he was contacted to come in and give a polygraph. Joseph did willingly come in. So that is definitely something I don't know if they were expecting or not, but usually a lot of people will kind of see that as a sign. Oh, they're, you know, they're willingly cooperating. So they have nothing to hide. Um, but when he took this polygraph, he certainly did not pass it. Now we all know how I feel about polygraphs. <laughs> they are not admissible in court for a reason. They are not concrete evidence by any means, but I do think they are good tools in determining, you know, whether to consistently follow a lead or not. And that is essentially why they are used by law enforcement. Also, if someone fails it and they know that police are going to continue to look into them, sometimes it makes them crack. And that is exactly what happened to Joseph McGowan. So immediately after being told that he had failed his polygraph horribly, Joseph McGowan asked for a priest. So I am sure you can assume exactly what is coming next. He asked for the authorities to come back in and he ultimately confessed to the murder of seven-year-old Joan and told authorities exactly where they could locate her body. After hearing what Joseph McGowan had to say, which I will get into in just a minute, authorities immediately contacted Palisades Interstate Parkway Police, specifically a man named James Donnelly. And uh, Bergen County Police said, look, <laughs> 
we've got a pretty large situation on our hands and we think it is very possible that a man that we have in our custody may have murdered a seven-year-old girl, taken her across state lines into New York and disposed of her body in Harriman State Park. And so they asked for Palisades Interstate Parkway police to send officers to Harriman State Park near Gate Hill Road and Route 210. And they were able to give landmarks and all of these other descriptions that have been given to them by Joseph McGowan to hopefully locate Joan relatively quickly. Six different patrolmen were sent out to this location. They began their search and I kid you not, within 20 minutes, they located Joan. She, from my understanding of the way it's described, there was like this large rock structure. It was almost like two large rock formations came together to kind of form a bit of a cave that was out of sight. Um, and that is where Joan's body ended up being found. She was hidden behind this rock formation, completely nude, only 100 feet away from Route 210. And based on the way her body was found, she went through an unimaginable amount of trauma. They were able to locate, I believe, some of her clothing in a parking lot nearby. And after finding her remains, yes, they did have to positively identify them. But right away by 2.55 p.m. that same day, Easter Sunday, Joseph McGowan was arrested and charged with the murder of Joan D'Alessandro. Now, right away, Joan was transported to have an autopsy done. They wanted identification and they wanted to find out what on earth this man had done to her. And it is rough. Um, medical examiner Frederick Zugaby, and I, I do believe I'm pronouncing that last name right, um, performed Joan's autopsy and found, again, that she had just suffered from an absolutely brutal and horrific death. She died ultimately from asphyxiation, um, and she also had multiple head injuries that likely could have contributed to that. She had been horribly beaten to the point of suffering multiple broken bones, like multiple broken bones. If you want to go and look at it, there is a list out there of all of the different injuries she sustained. I personally cannot even begin to get into the depth of them all because it makes my stomach turn. Um, but she... I mean, would have been completely unrecognizable finding her. Um, and on top of that, she had also very obviously been sexually assaulted. Medical examiner Frederick Zugaby claimed that this was the most brutal case that he had investigated in the entirety of his career. This rocked the entire community. Everyone had been out looking for this little girl. Everyone had walked by the McGowan home countless times looking for this little girl. And while everyone obviously knew, you know, kids should stay away from strangers and they taught all these things to their children, everyone knows there's people with bad intentions out there. Not a single person really expected it to be a neighbor. This led to a lot of changes in the community just even within the couple of days after Joan went missing and after her remains were found. Parents were tightening their rules like crazy in this area. Neighborhoods that had previously been filled with kids riding their bikes and playing hopscotch and, you know, running back and forth between houses to play. Um, all these places were now empty. There were no kids all on the streets. There were no kids riding their bikes. Uh, parents began to even set up different neighborhood carpools because a lot of the children in this area were able to walk to and from school. And so that's what they did. But parents were so scared <laughs> of their neighbors at this point that they began to have these carpools taking turns to gather carloads of children and take them to school so that nothing could possibly happen to them to and from on their walk. At the same time, this curiosity was also piqued in a lot of people because Joseph McGowan was a seemingly average high school teacher that lived a very quiet life in this neighborhood. He had absolutely no criminal history. And so to see what he managed to do to this little girl um, was just bewildering everyone. And so dozens of people started to flock to the neighborhood. For some reason, they wanted to get a look at Joseph McGowan 
someone's house. I'm not exactly sure what they thought they were going to get from that, um, but they were doing it and it got to the point that police actually had to completely shut off the road for a while. That clearly did not stop anyone. Instead, people just would head down the road on foot. Um, I think people genuinely, when these kinds of things happen, this curiosity comes from this place of trying to like understand and comprehend how someone could do something like this. Like we're all searching for one thing that sticks out that's like, oh, this is why this happened. Oh, this one thing seems off. That's why this occurred. Because this idea that something so average and someone seemingly so normal could commit such a heinous crime makes everything seem incredibly scary. You start to wonder what you can trust, who you can trust. So this community was definitely going through a lot at the time. And this curiosity for a lot of people ultimately turned into absolute fiery rage. So Joseph, at the start, had his bail set to $50,000. And you want to talk about people losing their ever-loving marbles. People were pissed. They did not believe at all that he should have any opportunity to be able to get out on bail, that this bail was set way too low for the crime that he had committed, and the fact that no one had evaluated him at this point to even see or determine if he could potentially be any sort of threat. And so hundreds of calls began to flood in to the courthouse, demanding that his bail be entirely revoked so that parents were even able to sleep at night. The thought that this man could potentially potentially, you know, realistically raise that amount of money to make the bail and be released and go back to his home, just houses away from the D'Alessandro family, was just not something anyone was willing to accept. Um, and there were other people, again, on a completely opposite side of the spectrum, that voice that they hoped that he managed to make bail so that they could personally get their hands on him. So a lot of people just felt incredibly strongly um, about what was going on, understandably. So in response, Judge Morris Pashman to de decided to take another look at the information, um, another look at the decision that was made, and ultimately did decide to revoke the bail pending a psychiatric evaluation. Because this is something that honestly should have been done to begin with. Things like this are typically taken into account. They needed to be able to check and see if he would be any sort of threat if he was released. And honestly, I'm glad they decided to do this because boy, did they open a big old can of worms. And I'm also glad that they did this. And I'm also glad that they did this because when this information came out, when Judge Morris Pashman decided to revoke this bail, there was a lot of pushback from the McGowan family. They had actually already raised all of the money to bail him out, his friends and family had. Um, and so his attorney tried to argue against this, tried to um, have you know the bail reinstated, but ultimately there was nothing that could be done. The psychiatric evaluation had to go through. And so Joseph was sent to solitary confinement at Bergen County Jail until his evaluation. And this was done basically for his safety, essentially, because of what he did. According to a spokesman for that particular jail, um, he told reporters that, quote, it's better this way. Some of the other prisoners don't take too kindly to him. This is something that usually in prison, someone just gets absolutely torn to pieces for um, any sort of child abuse, um, murder of a child, things along those lines. So that is the main reason that he was in solitary, not necessarily because he was any sort of like flight risk in terms of trying to escape or anything. Um, but anyways, it, again, it wasn't just prisoners that wanted to get their hands on him. All those people who wanted him to make his bail so they could get to him instead seemed to focus their anger and unfortunately like a very misdirected way. Um, I just feel so awful for this entire community because I think everyone was going through so much emotionally that no one knew how to deal with it. And so unfortunately, people were going in the phone book, finding anyone under the name of McGowan and calling them and unleashing all hell to whoever answered on the other side of the phone line. And unfortunately, it ended up harming a lot of people, like innocent families that were not at all related, just so happened to have the same last name. Um, there are quite a few articles 
articles out there about what these families went through. Um, and just that, you know, while people may have had good intentions to maybe stop for a second and think about what you're doing. Now, when Joseph's background was looked into deeper, people were trying to understand how on earth any of this happened. Again, looking for like that one red flag that maybe could explain all of this. Not like it would make it any better, but people again, just need that explanation. Um, Joseph had actually been a teacher at two separate schools and led an incredibly average life. So people didn't necessarily get what they thought they were going to. Um, all of his friends, all of his coworkers, pretty much majority of people that knew him were shocked at his arrest. So the principals at the two schools that he had worked at in his career described him as being a very competent teacher. They had absolutely no issues with him. Colleagues had pretty much only good things to say about him. He had never caused any issues with anyone. He wasn't, you know, into drama or, you know, any of these things. He literally just did his job and went about his life. Again, he had absolutely no criminal history whatsoever. And on top of that, he was incredibly dedicated to his family, according to those that knew him and he would go above and beyond for anyone. So this entire situation just seemed so out of left field. He had actually moved from New York to Hillsdale about two years prior in order to take care of his mother and grandmother that were aging. But the psych evaluation unveiled the reality of Joseph McGowan. And honestly, this may be one of the scariest individuals that I've looked into because ah, I've looked into a lot of serial killers. You guys already know I am huge on like criminal profiling, the psychology behind criminals, understanding why they're doing what they're doing to hopefully progress and prevent things like this from happening. And this is the scariest kind of person to me, someone who can so without fail, like unbreaking, look so normal and act so normal, but on the inside have rageful, dangerous tendencies that leads to things like this. If you're into psychology, this is definitely something to look into. I'll mention a book that you might wanna check out at the end of this video. He was evaluated on April 25th, 1973 by a psychiatrist, I believe it's Noel Galen. It could possibly be Noel Galen. Also, I apologize that my rooster is screaming outside of my window right now. Um, so Joseph told Dr. Galen in great detail what had happened that day, which is already something that first of all, you want, you want to be able to prosecute. You want these details to be able to look for evidence that corresponds. You want that. However, it's also a massive red flag when it comes to individuals that commit crimes like this, um, because it could indicate that they enjoy reliving these things, which is major serial killer vibes. So Joseph claimed that he was cutting grass that day outside of his house when Joan approached him to deliver these cookies that he said he had ordered weeks prior. Now, he claimed that he went inside the house at this point and that Joan followed him, which I'm on the fence about if I believe or not, just because she was told not to do things like that. I think it's way more likely that he somehow lured her in um, or maybe followed behind her forcefully getting her to go in. But regardless, he said that once he got inside of the home, he realized that he did not have the exact money that was owed. And it's not even that he said he didn't have enough money. I believe it was like, like for instance, it's like $15 and all he has is a $20 bill. Um, he just didn't have the exact change. And so he claimed not having that exact amount embarrassed him. And so because he was embarrassed, he decided to lash out. So for some reason, he grabbed Joan and took her downstairs to his bedroom. Now, he proceeded to explain what exactly he did to her, which again, I will not get into in full details. She was, in fact, it was confirmed through the autopsy report that she was sexually assaulted. And while describing the attack, Joseph McGowan was, you know, describing how he did harm her, that he beat her, um, things along those lines, but he was adamant that he did not sexually assault her. Now, I have seen, again, looking through appeals papers, <laughs> what he claimed that he did do, and let's just say, it's still sexual assault. Like, I don't know how he is justifying what he is in his mind. He didn't believe what he did was actually an assault against her. Um, but he said that after doing all of these different things to Joan, that quote, all of a sudden I realized what I had done. If I let her go, my whole life was gone. All I could think of was just to get rid of her. So he proceeded to attempt to kill Joan to preserve 
his own life. Um, and his multiple attempts to kill her were not successful. So again, she just repeatedly went through absolutely horrific abuse until he finally suffocated her using a bag. So while he seemed to explain this away to, I was just embarrassed, that is not a connection majority of people make at all. Um, and so he claimed that at this point, he decided to wrap her in an old couch cover and put her in the trunk of his car to dispose of her body. He said that he cleaned up all of the blood that was left behind with old t-shirts, the blood that was in the house. And then he took all of these items and headed off to cross state lines into New York to Harriman Park, which was, I believe, about 20 miles away from his home and Jones. Once he reached Harriman Park, he disposed of her body by hiding it behind the rocks. And then he claimed that he took took the uh, trash bags that were filled with the t-shirts and um, the couch cover and all of those things and disposed of them and random trash cans along the way back home. And what's interesting about this is, again, he is trying to claim that all of this was so random and out of nowhere, but being so random and out of nowhere, like he sure knew a specific place 20 miles away that he wanted to dispose of a body. He sure knew exactly what to do when this happened. Um, and so you're kind of able to see here at this point that this was obviously something, despite his own claims, that this man had been thinking about for quite some time, whether it was about Joan in specific or not we'll find out, but he clearly had thoughts like this on his mind before. And one of the most sickening parts about all of this is that after he took Joan's nude body and shoved it in an unnatural position behind a rock in the middle of a park, he returned home and joined in the search efforts for Joan, knowing what he had done to her just hours before. Again, serial killer vibes going on here. He even told this psychiatrist, Dr. Galen, quote, I felt better when I went back to the house. I slept well. Now, the full reports by Dr. Galen that were released on June 6, 1973, essentially outlined everything that Joseph had already said, but also went more into depth about not just the crime he committed against Joan, but again, what his tendencies may be. And apparently during this evaluation, he made it very clear that he had a history of an attraction to young children. Um, he mentioned being attracted to his 12 year old cousin at one point. Um, he mentioned having fantasies about sexual assault. Um, and ultimately what the psychiatrist determined was that his mother had been very overprotective and dominating his entire life. And so essentially he struggled with his masculinity because of this. And Dr. Galen said, quote, younger girls would pose no threat to his rather shaky concept of his manhood. This was not the only psychiatrist to evaluate him. He was evaluated by numerous psychiatrists and psychologists all during this time frame, um, including a Dr. Emmanuel Fisher. And it was determined by Emmanuel Fisher that McGowan has a, quote, tense and hysterical personality whose tendency is to act out um, on mood and impulse in a very explosive manner. Rational controls are weak, despite the fact that he is an exceedingly brilliant individual. Dr. Fisher went on to say that he has a, quote, tremendous amount of underlying unconscious hostility, and basically that he represses it and avoids it and intellectualizes it. So essentially, this man is so smart that he can figure out how to perfectly mesh into day-to-day -day activities, mirror the way that he should be acting towards other people, um and seem as if nothing is going on, even convince himself that nothing is going on, repress everything. And that is why he appeared so incredibly normal. But underneath that top level, he was basically a ticking time bomb. Had another evaluation that October where he again continued to speak about all of these different fantasies that he had. He spoke about working at a summer camp and the children that were there. Um, and it was determined during this evaluation that he conceals a lot of his identity and controls his underlying psychosis very well, again, because he ha is so incredibly smart and has managed to figure out how to trick himself and others. And essentially, 
essentially mask incredibly well. And, but sometimes it doesn't always work. And so essentially, if he has even the slightest moment where he is out of control, anyone in that vicinity is going to be a victim, basically. Like it does not matter when he goes off, he goes off. And that means death. And that is exactly what happened to Joan. It was essentially determined that it could have been Joan. It could have been a pizza delivery person. Whoever could have been there at that time would have been the one. That is why he was deemed to be so incredibly dangerous. It was determined that he had the potential to absolutely act again, that he was very unpredictable. Um, so no one would even really see it coming. Um, and he, again, he seemed to enjoy talking about what he did to Joan. He seemed to enjoy talking about all these fantasies that he had. So there seemed to be absolutely no understanding in his mind that what he did was really wrong. There was no remorse that was seen. So ultimately he never made it for bail. And on June 19th, 1974, he ended up pleading guilty to murder. Um, yet again, his attorney attempted to come to bat for him. I feel like at that point there wasn't much that his attorney could do. Um, but I guess attempting to at least put up some sort of defense, um, despite pleading guilty, his attorney was like, Oh, well, but we're not pleading guilty to the sexual assault. I don't know why there was this aspect in all of this where he did not want to admit to that. And it's almost like, again, he had justified that he did sexually assault her by saying that it wasn't technically sexual assault. There's got to be something more to that. I need to honestly look into the psychology behind it a little bit more. Um, but this was obviously rejected because there was very, very clear evidence that she had been. There was no getting around it. And so on November 4th, 1974, Joseph was sentenced to life in prison. Now, meanwhile, Frank and Rosemarie were learning to live without their daughter um, that had been completely taken away from them. This little girl that was so full of life and so spunky and, you know, just such a joy to be around, that is a massive loss. And not just to her family, but the community and those at their church, it was a lot. And so a service was held for Joan in the same church where she was just days away from receiving her first communion. And she had touched the hearts of so many people that I believe over 900 people showed up to her funeral to say their goodbyes, to show support for Joan's family. Her coffin was covered in white carnations and lilies, flowers that she would have absolutely loved. Um, and following the ceremony, she was laid to rest in Ascension Cemetery in New York. For the next 25 years or so, it was relatively quiet. The D'Alessandros attempted to continue forward with their life, um, remembering Joan every way they possibly could. Um, they went on to have two other children, um, and they just grieved while Joseph sat in prison. And to their understanding, they're like, you know, we heard this sentence of life in prison, so he's never going to get out. Like, it's life in prison. Um, and then came the awful reality of parole. And this sparked an absolute fire. And Rosemary, that I kid you not, to this day is still burning nonstop. So according to interviews that Rosemary has done, like I stated, she thought life in prison was life in prison. That's what everyone thought that was close to Joan, that this man would never have an opportunity to see the light of day again after what he had done to this little girl and the threat that he could pose to so many other people. But after just like 14 years, he was up for parole. And I feel like this is not something that's really talked about enough. I feel like I don't even talk about it enough or think about it enough on my channel and I should and it's definitely something I'm going to be more vocal about from here on out. And I don't think it's that we don't necessarily know what parole is or like understand what happens, but I don't think we've really ever looked into it from like the family's perspective and how terrible it can be for them and the trauma that it reignites because they essentially have to do this fight all over again. After going through losing a loved one and some of them fighting for years to finally see that perpetrator locked up in prison, having to 15 years later go in front of another, you know, judge and f basically plead with them to not let this individual out because of what they did, having to re-explain what happened to their loved ones and hopes that it will convince the judge to make sure this person is never released. 
Um, it is a lot. And I obviously, I think we all do know that that happens, but it's just not focused on quite enough. And this reality smacked the D'Alessandro family like a ton of bricks. He was up for parole in around 94 and the parole process starts way earlier than just 94. So like 92, 93, they knew it was coming up and the D'Alessandro's attorney was basically like, look, I know this is not fun. I know this is traumatic for you, but if you guys don't fight, there is a very good chance that he is going to be released because apparently this entire time that he was in prison, um, he had been on quote, good behavior, which I mean, try saying that to a family. Like, I don't understand how judges can look a family in the face and say, oh, but like the past 25 years while in a very controlled environment, <laughs> um, you know, where he's surrounded by police and guards and all these different things, he was on good behavior. Well, it's like no crap, but do you not remember what this person did? years ago. Um, but he was, I guess, on good behavior. And um, on top of that, he had been very briefly evaluated by numerous psychiatrists along this time. But from my understanding, it was like sitting down with him for like five minutes, nothing in depth, um, which is really surprising to me. Um, and because it was not an in-depth evaluation, all of these psychiatrists, it was determined that he um, should be put up for parole, that he should be given that chance. So Joan's family began to fight with Rosemary really at the forefront, pushing this movement because she is realizing what she's about to go through and what all these other families have gone through and that nobody should have to go through this. So while she is trying to, you know, figure out ways to convince this judge to not release this man, she also began to fight for something known as Joan's Law. Now... I will get deeper into Jones Law in a minute, um, but evaluations during this time, because he was about to be up for parole, like more in-depth evaluations were done again and again. Thank goodness they were because, spoiler alert, absolutely nothing changed. So unlike every other evaluation in those prior years, um, especially when he was originally evaluated prior to his um, conviction, this time, Joseph denied any fantasies at all about younger children, and he seemed to completely shy away from discussing the crime at all, which to some may seem like progress. Some might look at this and say, oh, well, if he's not wanting to talk about it anymore, uh, maybe he's ashamed, maybe he's remorseful, maybe he doesn't have those fantasies anymore. However, it was noted by Dr. McNeil, who was performing this evaluation, that Joseph was not displaying these particular things because he was healing in any way, shape or form. Uh, but instead he was doing what he had always done and he was being a chameleon and he was morphing to what he knew he needed to morph into and essentially was dealing with it using different types of denial and repression than he typically did. Um, because essentially what ended up coming out is he confessed that someone told him that if he just decided to plead guilty and went to prison, that he would essentially just go to therapy. And after a few years of therapy, he would be released. And so I think when when he realized that's what they were looking for. He's like, okay, this is what they want. So this is what I'm going to give them. And so he switched things up and realized what he should and shouldn't say. And that's what he was going forward with. But thankfully the psychiatrist recognized that and said, look, I don't think that this is good. I don't think we are going in any sort of positive direction. And this is actually very similar to the behavior that he likely would have been going through and showing at the time that he decided to murder Joan. Um, so Joseph was given during this time very specific things that he needed to work on, different therapies, um, and essentially he would be back up for parole in 1998. So ultimately Jones Law was signed on April 3rd, 1997 by Governor Christy Whitman of New Jersey. And this was really the first big thing that was accomplished for victims, for their families, directly revolving around this atrocity that can be parole, you know? And I'm not saying that parole is always an awful thing. There are some people that I do believe have genuinely been rehabbed and deserve another chance. 
Um, I'm, I'm not completely against it, but there are situations like this where someone has taken the life of another human being and knowing that these families have to continuously fight for justice for that person is absolutely wild to me. Um, and so this law, Jones Law, made it so that anyone who murdered a child under the age of 14 in conjunction with a sexual offense would never be eligible for parole because no family should ever have to continue that fight for their child. We've seen the ebbs and flows of true crime cases and disappearances and murders. And there is this media explosion and everyone knows and there's all this action and then things quiet down. And then when someone is arrested, there's this other explosion. And then there's all this interest in the trial. And you know, when people have their eyes on something, there's all these things that are done. There's all this um, victim's advocacy. There's all this pushing for change. But once there is a conviction or something along those lines, it's like this sense of relief. Everyone needs a break because it's been a lot. It's been exhausting. It's scary to see what other people are capable of. And so after that, everyone just kind of goes quiet. They think justice is justice when in reality, those same people that you so desperately wanted to be put away might get out in a handful of years. So again, I just think it's definitely something that we need to put a lot more focus on. Um, anyway, so this would be huge for families. Um, families wouldn't time and time again have to continue to fight for justice for their loved one. And while this would not change anything for Joan or the D'Alessandro family, it would not keep Joseph in prison because this, you know, was passed after her death. Um, it would at least spare other families from that point on. And that is a pretty huge deal for those families. It's something that they will never, ever have to experience. Even bigger stuff was in October of 1998, October 30th to be more specific, um, a federal version of the law was signed into place, which is just absolutely crazy. It was signed in by President Clinton. Um, and that is a massive step in terms of protecting these victims and protecting these families from any further pain um, having to do with the perpetrator, this person that was responsible for all of this trauma and pain in their life. And around the same time, as you guys know, Joseph was yet again up for parole. So he was yet again evaluated by Dr. McNeil. He continued to state essentially all of the same things that he said in his previous evaluation, um, still stuck by his guns, that there were no fantasies that he had about children, denied anything about that. One thing that did happen is that he all of a sudden entirely changed his story about how any of this even came to be. So originally he had stated that Joan showed up while he was mowing his grass and that the only reason he went after Joan was because he was embarrassed about not having the right amount of money. But at this point, he's kind of showing an even nastier reality. Apparently he was just in a very bad place at that time and he had contemplated ending his life and he was in his own words, not successful um, in his own words. And so basically he saw Joan while he was in this very chaotic state of mind and thought, well, if I can't do that to myself, can I do that to this little girl? And so he became quote, overwhelmed with unexplainable feelings of rage. And so that is ultimately why he decided to go after Joan. And no one at this point had heard him say anything like this. So we're talking two decades where he has been essentially lying through his teeth about the real reasons why he decided to attack her. Again, I think that was him trying to protect himself. That was one of his masks of being like, I was again determined that he had made absolutely no progress. He had not done any of the things that the court had asked him to do. Um, and he had not confronted his own impulses, really progressed at all. So he was still seen as a huge risk. And when he was able to go up for himself and speak to the judge during his appeals hearing, um, he really just dug himself even deeper into this hole. We're talking like he's now like 30 feet underground. And I don't know if this was him, um, genuinely believing what he had been allegedly told that if he just went to therapy and all of that, that he would get out in a couple of years. I don't know if he was just floundering because he felt like he had done all of this for all of this, say that loosely for nothing. Um, but he seemingly just started to say whatever. Um, I feel like there was a crack in his mask and his facade, which to me just indicates that during this time period, he was at one of those points where he could totally snap and harm someone else. And so I, I honestly think it was kind of important for 
that to happen during one of his appeals. So he began to admit after, again, all of the denial um, that he had actually dated a 16 year old student as he was a teacher. Um, that came out for the very first time, 20 some years later, just kind of proving even more that he had the, these pedophilic tendencies, despite the fact that he was still somehow denying them. So again, we have him justifying his own actions. Like he doesn't want to see anything wrong in what he's doing. Um, and so just because he views it a certain way, he believes everyone else should see it the same. And he went on to stand by what he had said in his evaluation that it was never about not having the right amount of money, that he just felt this rage and decided to go after Joan. And he even said, quote, that it was a, quote, total fabrication. And when he was asked why on earth he had lied about this for all of these years, for these decades, he said, quote, I will say almost anything when I'm scared. And again, don't know what he thought he was doing here. If he believed he was doing himself a favor, I genuinely think he believes that his version of things and his perspective is the only one that exists. And he like cannot comprehend there's another one. It was absolutely awful. And he was even asked to speak about the events of that night, um, what he had done to her, like go through everything. And he literally said <laughs> that talking about the crime is trivial because there's no reason to open a can of worms when nobody cares about it. And I genuinely hope that Joan's family did not have to be there to hear him say that. But as I'm sure you're guessing, the response from the court was, quote, your lack of progress in reducing the likelihood of future criminal behavior since your last parole hearing in 1994 and for the matter, since your arrest in 1973 is stunning. So his parole was denied, stating that he had not progressed, that he had actually regressed, and that he had the personality of a, quote, mass murderer, which I feel like is very apparent at this point. This is like straight out of Mindhunter, um, straight out of the entire list of FBI cases of serial killers, someone that just seems to totally lack understanding that what they are doing is wrong. And this leads me to um, that same year, the one and only John Douglas. You guys already know I am a massive fan of John Douglas. Um, he is an FBI agent who is the man behind Criminal Minds and Mindhunter. And he's interviewed some of the most notorious serial killers and and he actually had a chance to sit down and interview Joseph. This interview and Joan's story is highlighted in his book, The Killer Across the Table. So if you were interested in listening to that, it's not the only case in that book, I believe, but it's definitely something if you were interested to dig deeper into the psychology of um, Joseph McGowan and kind of understanding that. If you're interested in profiling at all, it's definitely something that you would be interested in. Um, but John Douglas said, after interviewing him, quote, there was never one little fiber of guilt or remorse as he proceeded to tell me what he did to her. Did come up for parole a handful of other times over the next 10, 20 years, um, but he did remain in prison the entire time. So he definitely did not progress at all. He did not ever show any sign of remorse. It was the same thing over and over again. And ultimately on June 5th, 2021, he ended up dying in prison prison, exactly where he should have died. Um, now, Rosemary said, quote, the first thought that came into my mind is now we could concentrate on the 50th anniversary of Joan's impactful and loving legacy, which will be 50 years in 2023. So next year, this next April will be the 50th anniversary of not Joan's death. I absolutely love that she says Joan's legacy because that is exactly what this is. And instead of having to spend this entire time thinking about, oh my gosh, when is his next parole hearing gonna be? What is he gonna say this time? Are his evaluations going to change? Is he, is he going to morph into something else to where he can maybe successfully convince people that he should be out this time? Um, it's not something that they have to worry about anymore. But Joan's Law was not the only massive impactful change that came from Joan's legacy and all of Rosemary's pushing along with all of the others that were in support of Joan and fighting for victims' rights. So in 2000, it's actually November 17th, 2000, um, the Justice for Victims law passed in New Jersey and this was a huge push for victims' rights. Because essentially what this law does is it totally eliminates the statute of limitations when it comes to wrongful death suits that involve murder, manslaughter, or aggravated manslaughter. That was passed and and this was actually one law that Rosemary was able to use for her gain and to 
help Joan and help push for even more laws. So after this was passed on April 19th, 2001, on the anniversary of Joan's legacy, um, she turned around and used this law to file a wrongful death suit against Joseph McGowan, which I am just, there is this satisfaction within me because she did not at all want him to be able to um, get any sort of inheritance or possibly like sell a book or anything using Joan's story and what he had done to her um, to essentially be able to raise funds to fight for his parole. Like she did not want him getting any money to hire an a, attorney, a better attorney, what have you. Um, and so she ended up winning this lawsuit. And so every bit of money of his ended up just essentially funneling to Rosemary. And she funneled that directly into the Joan D'Alessandro Memorial Foundation, um, or it's referred to as Joan's Joy. So this is yet another thing that came from Joan's legacy. It was created to help promote child safety. It's a nonprofit organization. And you guys, the amount of good that they do is out of this world. Um, a lot of their focus right now, like as of today is helping a lot of the homeless youth continue to advocate for victims' rights. There is an entire website that you can go to. I'm just like very briefly browsing on it right now. Um, you can look at the case background, look at Joan's legacy, which is basically a big list of all of the different accomplishments that they have made in Joan's name in order to push forward. Um, there's a different events and news section that you can go to where you can see different things that Joan's Joy uh, Foundation is going to be doing. For instance, they hold something called Safety Fest every September um, where there's different raffles to raise money. They've got music. They um, spend a lot of time educating the community and not just that, but they work really hard to encourage families going through the same things. There are a lot of different ways that you can help. So if you are in particular nearby, I know that you can volunteer for some of their different events. Um, if you are not nearby, you can actually reach out to them to figure out a way to start a fundraiser in your area to help help raise money so that they can do the most that they possibly can to fight for victims advocacy. You can also donate, which is incredibly helpful. Um, there's just a lot of really great things. I highly encourage you guys to go and check out the website. They also have a Facebook page and other um, different social media accounts. Um, on top of that, New York actually also ended up passing their own version of Jones Law, I believe in 2004. And Governor George E. Pataki, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, actually signed it in Harriman State Park which is ultimately where Joan's body ended up being found. So to see that location that had once held so much pain, um, hold so much importance and change, I absolutely love to see that totally flipped around. You know, it's just something that I wish could happen for every single victim of crime. And on July 21st, 2017 in New Jersey, and most recently, they did decide to go and change Jones Law a bit. So while it was 14 and under, um, it is now 18 and under. So that is absolutely an awesome change. I'm ecstatic about it. And according to most recent interviews with Rosemary, they do have other things in the works at the moment. So there's so much going on. And to just see decades later, all the work and change that's going in. It's just absolutely astonishing. And I love seeing this continued advocacy. Rosemarie has said, quote, I'm so thankful that I was not overcome by hate so I could advocate for what I believed in, which was justice and prevention. She said that she could not simply put Joan in a cemetery and leave her there. Instead, she said that she, quote, wanted her to be remembered, to be known. She stood up for others. I was going to stand up for her. And in April of 2014, a butterfly garden was created and named after Joan. It is absolutely beautiful. I will include a couple of pictures here. Butterflies are just a really important symbol for Rosemary and when it comes to Joan and everyone who works with this foundation. So it's definitely something that is incredibly beautiful and meaningful. It's a great place for anyone to go and just sit and remember Joan. It's, you know, surrounded in flowers, which were one of Joan's absolute favorite things. And in in that garden is probably one of the best things I've seen through the entirety of this case. It just encompasses everything so well. There is a sculpture and it reads, remember Joan today so tomorrow's children will be safe. 
whether you knew about this case or not, all of these changes have affected you, have affected your community um, and fight for you and your rights and your children's rights. And so this is definitely one that I really want you guys to continue to follow, to continue to support, because again, according to Joan and her sons who also work right beside her, um, there's a lot more that is to come. I have heard that there is going to be a documentary. I have heard that there is going to be another book that I think is actually going to be directly from Joan's family. That is also something you should definitely support. Um, when all of those things come out, if I'm able to locate them, I will definitely pass that information along. There is so much to take away from this case. There is so much to learn. And one of my favorite parts about it is that there's still so much that can be done. Um, and I honestly am so thankful that I was given the suggestion by one of you guys to cover in my series where I'm looking at cases that have impacted so many people and made so much change because I feel like by the ends of so many of these videos that I do, it just feels so dark. It feels so hopeless sometimes. Be able to end this on a note where so much good has come from this is just, it's a breath of fresh air. It really honestly is. As always, you guys, make sure to go and follow everything you possibly can in regards to this case. Go show support. Um, go give a donation. I'm giving a donation on behalf of our channel to Jones Joy Foundation. Um, if you're in the community, offer to volunteer. It doesn't have to be monetary. There are other ways that you can make change, even if it's just advocating for something like this in your particular area. Um, this has also really inspired me to look into maybe families in my area that are fighting for something like this, that are fighting for laws to be passed and pushed forward. Um, there's always something to do and there's always some way. At the very least, make sure that someone knows that they're not alone. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. I want to say a huge thank you to you guys for taking the time out of your day to listen to Joan's legacy. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland family so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And we'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.